Hello, everybody, and welcome to our 22 Things You Must Know About Revit Visibility Gra and Graphics webinar today. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Jason with us today, joining uh, joining us for this presentation. Uh, as some of you know, may know, we are Digital Drafting Systems, your uh, local uh, source for uh, for all things CAD. In, uh, in the area. So Jason, go ahead and jump over to that next slide for us. Okay, just some important uh, announcements for everybody. All lines will be muted while this presentation is going on. Uh, if you have questions or anything like that throughout the presentation, please send those over in the chat box or in the questions box, and we will be answering those at the end. Uh, for those who uh, would like AIA uh, credit for being here, AIA Continuing Education Credits, Please go ahead and send over your AIA number and name in the chat as well or in the questions box. We'll grab all that stuff from there. Uh, and this webcast will be recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel. And if you're registered for the webinar, you will be receiving an email with a link to the video after as well. Uh, for any questions, concerns, anything like that that we might be able to help you with, after this presentation, please give us a call at 305-445-6480. Or shoot us an email, an email at info at ddscad.com. Um, okay, Jason, jump over to that next slide for us. So uh, Jason is a BIM consultant who uh, helps people all around the world with Revit and other BIM software. Jason is also the founder of click to bim an online BIM resource site. And he is an Autodesk expert elite as well as a certified professional for all Revit disciplines. So again, we're very excited to have Jason here with us today. And uh, without any further ado, Jason, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. All right, thank you, Alan. I First off, I appreciate DDS CAD having me here to do this webinar. And I'm excited about the content that we have prepared to share. And I look forward to spending the next hour or so here with you all. So here's our list, kind of give you an idea of where we're going here. Uh, just if you're wondering why 22, we're like, well, it's 2022, why not shoot for 22? So, um, but if you're familiar with Revit, you know that there are hundreds of controls that affect vis, excuse me, that affect visibility and graphics in Revit. And so by visibility, I mean, does it actually show on your view? And then by graphics, how does it show in your view? Uh, so that's kind of an idea. Um, as Alan mentioned, I'm a BIM consultant. Uh, I've been working in Revit for about 15 years now. And I, just to kind of share a little bit with you, uh, I, I like to help people. I remember when I first started learning Revit and helping those in my office, I remember people going home at night just being dejected because they were having trouble understanding all of the intricacies in Revit. Uh, and even today, as I still work with various organizations, I see people getting frustrated. Uh, I see them getting their models in a jam and, and just people really struggling and grinding through projects. And one of the areas where I see a lot of issues is when it comes to visibility and graphics. And I've just seen all kinds of various issues. And it boils down to people not having a solid plan of how to handle that in their models and in the various views in their model. So I like to I like to share about the various controls and, and try to help people work through those. So that's kind of a, a high level overview of how we got to this topic. And then uh, we're going to dig into 22 specific things. Um, although I'll warn you, the first uh, six or seven, uh, we could probably come up with about you know, maybe 50 things within those first seven or so. And then after that, we're going to get very specific. But anyways, all right, let's go ahead and jump into this. So this is going to be pretty fast paced. Uh, but the good news is, is that it is being recorded. And so if you miss something, you'll be able to come back uh, and watch that recording. OK, let's jump into the first one. So the first thing that I think people need to understand is the graphic control hierarchy in Revit. And so I have this little pyramid here. And so starting at the bottom is where you should start in your project template or your projects, and then work your way up from there. Uh, and, and essentially every line item above 
overwrites everything below. Um, I know that a lot of you on the call are architects, but I did throw in the MEP systems, uh, so just kind of bear with me there. But real quick, I want to jump into a simple example here to demonstrate that. Uh, so, you know, it's one thing to put up a slide on the screen, but I want to actually show you how that works, okay? So right here, I have an air terminal. Uh, you may be wondering, why are we doing an air terminal? I'll show you real quick here. So if I go to the Manage ribbon, and we start out here in the Object Styles dialog, Air Terminals is right here at the top, so that makes it nice and easy for this example here. And then also we can add it to an MEP system. So I'm gonna start out by assigning the Air Terminals category the red color for our line color here, okay? So that kind of demonstrates, we wanna start out with the object styles, that'll control all, all of the categories for our entire project, okay, in any view. After that, we can override those on a view by view basis in the visibility graphic overrides dialog, okay? So some of this is probably pretty basic to some of you that have been using Revit. But just for example, let's kind of continue on. I'm just gonna kind of work my way down the list here of colors. All right, so our graphic overrides and the visibility graphic overrides dialog will overwrite our object styles. And then just a quick note here, if you are on the MEP side, if you have MEP systems set up and you have graphic overrides for those system types, those will override anything in your visibility graphic overrides dialog. All right, so we're just kind of, let me just pull this up one more time. We're just kind of working our way up here. And so you may be thinking, well, every time you make a change, it just updates the color. Well, just to prove that it's not, that there is indeed a hierarchy here. If I go back to the object styles and change it back to black, you'll notice that it doesn't change because we're continuing to override it as we go. Okay, the next thing on the list here is phase filters. So if I come in here and I change the phase filter to, uh, let's just say show complete, and then let's go to the phasing dialog here. And I'm going to change this to overridden, and we'll we'll dive into phases a little bit more in just a second here. Uh, just just a quick note on that. Uh, so we're at green. Let's go to cyan here. So a phase filter will overwrite your graphic overrides and MEP systems. And then next up we have view filters. Okay, so let's go ahead and add a view filter here. So I have a filter. So let's just change the line color for that filter. All right. So filters will override phase filters. And then we also have element overrides, okay? So if I select if I select the air terminal here and I will expand this little paintbrush icon and I'll select override by element. And then let's go ahead and just add, keep working our way up here. All right, so an element override will override everything below. And then lastly, on, on the tool that I threw in here that I recommend that um, a lot of, I recommend you don't use unless you absolutely have to, but the line work tool here, let's just take a look at it and I'm gonna, let's just do like a, say a hidden line and we override that. Okay, so just to show you what we've done here is we, we've basically just worked our way up this little pyramid here to represent the graphic control hierarchy in Revit, okay? So in terms of having a plan for how you're gonna control graphics in your view, Start at the bottom and then work your way up, okay? So the object styles obviously are the most uh, inclusive, if you will, and the most overarching in terms of your project. Um, I see people doing all kinds of random things. Um, I've seen projects with hundreds and hundreds of filters per view. Um, just try to keep it simple on yourself. Start at the bottom, work your way up there. Okay, all right, let me, let me continue on here and, and keep this thing rolling. So next up, we have visibility controls, okay? So when it comes to visibility, there's not really a hierarchy because if there's one thing that is affecting the visibility, then it's it's going to, let me back up. If there's one control that is turning the visibility off, then it's going to be off everywhere, okay? Um, there's not really a control that's going to override it to turn it back on. So if it's off in one place, then it's going to be off, okay? Um, so I think this list is, I, I think, pretty pretty much all inclusive or all encompassing, if you will. Um, I know there's a lot of things there. I won't cover everything. Um, 
if just a quick kind of plug here, if you check out the click to bim blog, we do have uh, a whole blog series dedicated specifically to visibility controls where we go into a little bit more detail into each one of these. Okay, I will expand on one thing here. So I, I usually tell people not to use work sets for visibility. And, and I feel like that's a pretty common practice in the industry today. Um, I know probably five, 10 years ago, I saw this quite a bit. Uh, but let me give you a few reasons here. I have them right there on your screen. Um, to begin with, it's very common that people model on the incorrect work set, okay? Um, so it happens all the time, okay? And I'm sure you've seen that in your projects. Uh, also, your work, your work set strategy can vary from project to project. And what I mean by that is if you're working on a, you know, say a, a two-story school, uh, you're probably gonna set up work sets one way. And if you're working on a 50-story high-rise, you're probably going to set up work sets differently for a high rise. And so what I mean by that is if you have a visibility strategy, kind of uh, a visibility plan around your work set plan, uh, then, then you have to adjust it if you adjust your work sets and it's just inefficient in my opinion. Uh, and then lastly there, what happens when you transmit a model and your work sets are discarded for whatever reason? Uh, that can affect the way that model is used downstream as well. So with that said, don't use work sets for visibility. There's several other options that you can use to create a solid plan uh, for visibility. Okay, let me pull this list back up here and you can see where we're at. So we're just now through number three. So let's jump into number four uh, filters now, okay? So I'm going to close this little model here and Let's jump into uh, another little mo sample model here. Okay, filters are, oh man, I'm, I'm a huge fan of filters. They, there's so many use cases for filters, okay? So let's take a quick look there. So if we go to the view ribbon and on the graphics panel, I'll click filters to open up our filters dialog. And here's where we can create filters. Um, so we can give it a name. I'll, I'm not gonna go into depth on all the controls here. Uh, we'll try to keep it focused on visibility and graphics. Uh, but basically, you, you tell Revit what category of elements you want your rules to apply to, and then you can specify AND rules or OR rules, and, and there's multi, you can create multiple rule sets, multiple rules. Uh, they can get very complex, okay? So just be aware that if you use AND filters, all of those filters must, all that filter criteria must be met for an element to be included in the filter. If you use or, then any one of those filters can be true for an element to be picked up. Okay, so I know I'm kind of going real quick here. Um, but the other tip here when it comes to filters is just make sure that you are very descriptive in how you name your filters, okay? Uh, so right now, this filter's this is just from the out of the box Revit, but it just says interior, okay? Uh, so that's kind of difficult for somebody to understand what this is, okay? So I would recommend doing something like function is interior, something like that, right? Have a, have a naming strategy around that. Because in this case, we're looking for the function parameter for elements belonging to these categories, and we want it to be interior. Okay, so then when we go into our visibility graphic overrides dialog and go to the filters tab, there's a lot of things that we can do here. Uh, we can control whether that filter is even enabled. We can control the visibility of those elements that are picked up in that filter. And then we can control, uh, as you can see here, line pa lines, patterns, transparency for both projection and surface lines and cut lines. We can even make them half tone here, okay? So just for example here, I'm gonna change the color to green, all right? And we can see that a bunch of these walls now turn green. And if I come in here and let's add, let's add another parameter here. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change the fire rating to two hours, okay? And I'm gonna create another filter around the fire rating parameter, okay? So let's create a new filter here. And we'll call it fire rating two hours. And I'm gonna apply it, let's just do it to walls. And we'll say the fire rating equals two hours. 
Okay, now let's go back to our visibility graphic overrides and here's, here's what I wanna show. So if I control, or, sorry, if I change this to red for our fire rating filter, and then we have, oh, and I actually misspelled that, I apologize. Uh, you'll notice that nothing happens here, okay? So we, we're, that interior filter is still the one that is taking priority. And the reason is, is because the order of the filters in this list, okay? So some people don't realize that, that you can create filters, but then also the order that they appear matters. So for example, if I select that fire rating filter and we move it up and then I click OK, now, oh, actually, what did I just do here? Sorry, I may, I may have missed something here. What did I do? Equals. I apologize for this. My demo here is. Um, okay, sorry. Let me. Let me. Oh, I know what I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did. I did projection lines. My apologies for that. Okay. Um, so my point is. Sorry. I was trying to make a simple point here, and I got. I got way too detailed there. So the order that the filters appear affect the graphic controls, okay? So what I mean by that is if we have walls that are being picked up by two filters, then you have to be aware of the order uh, of these filters in this list, okay? So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, also, be aware whether you're adjusting the projection lines or your cut lines. Uh, as you saw, I just did. I, I kind of messed that up there. Anyways, main point there, the order that these appear in in the list is is very critical there. Okay, let's let's move uh, let's move to the next one here. So this this is maybe a kind of a fringe visibility and graphics, uh, but one thing that I see quite a bit are tons and tons of section views in models. Okay, what I recommend is have have a plan around those. Okay, and what I mean by that is have uh, a section view types created for documentation views and working views. Okay, so let me just show you real quick here. I'll just show you a a section head here, this is pretty typical, right? We can place this on a sheet, we'll have the detail number, the sheet number, pretty normal, okay? What I also recommend people do is create section view types for working views, all right? And then what we can do here is we can use our initials. So in this case, I'm gonna give my initials and then this is a, uh, a north-south looking section, okay? So I can look north or south with this section. And now I have a working uh, working section here and then a documentation section. Um, the reason that I think this is important is so that when somebody opens the model and they take a look here at what's going on, they know that, okay, hey, this is different than that. And it's easy to distinguish between your working sections and your documentation sections. Um, and what I typically do when I set up a project, I say, okay, each user in the in the model, you get two section views one looking north-south, one looking east-west. And then we can even create a filter around that. So let me, I'll do this, do another one real quick here. So we'll do working sections. Uh, we're going to apply it to the sections category and we'll say family and type equals uh, sections and then sections dash working, okay? So I'll click okay. Let's go back here and add that. And now we can use that. Um, if, if, if once again, if we're talking about visibility, it really doesn't matter the order in the list. Okay, so if you have something off, it's going to be off. It doesn't matter the order that it is in the list here. Okay, but now that I have that, I can use that to control the visibility of those working views in in the various views in your project. So if you have documentation views set up, you can use a filter to turn off all your working sections. Um, so my main point there is just Having a plan for all those section views, I've I have literally seen models with over a thousand section views that just they just added up over time. People just continuing to add and add and add. Uh, that also helps with model maintenance, so you can go in there and remove all those extra ones just to to help keep your model decluttered a bit. So once again, not not directly visibility and graphics per se, but but kind of related there. Okay, just gonna put the list back up here one more time. Let's keep rolling along here. Let's move on to phasing. Okay, so I have another simple example set up here. 
So when it comes to phasing, there's really kind of two main things that you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of the phase status of the elements, as well as the phase and the phase filter of the view, okay? So for example, in this view, we just have a level one floor plan view. If I scroll to the bottom, you'll notice here there's a, a phase filter, which I have the generic show all, and then the phase is set to new construction. And then we have the, I have four walls here, phasing param two phasing parameters, phase created, phase demolished. I'm gonna open up the phasing dialog here and let's take a look here at the phase filters. So with just those two phases, uh, um, existing in new construction, we can put the elements in one of four phase status conditions, new, existing, demolished, and temporary. And then, with the phase filter, we can control how the elements in each of those phase statuses is going to appear. All right, and there's three options. We can choose for it to just to appear by category, which is just going to be based on the object styles and then any visibility graphic overrides that we have. We can choose for them to not display at all, or we can choose for them to be overridden. And when they're overridden, then it uses the controls on the graphic overrides tab here in the phasing dialog. So we have that set up. So let's just take a look here real quick at the, those, how we can get them into the various phase statuses. So right now I'll select this wall, we'll change the phase created to existing, and I'll leave, leave phase demolish set to none. Now we have an existing wall. Same thing here, new construction none, that means this is a new wall in the new construction phase, which is what the, the view is currently set to. And now if I change this third wall to phase created, uh, sorry, the phase created to existing and we change the phase demolished to new construction, then it's demolished in the new construction phase. And lastly, if it's created and demolished in the same phase, then it is temporary in that phase, okay? So I know, I know we went through that really fast, but with just the two phases, we can get four phase status conditions. And then we can use the phase filter to control how those elements in the various phase statuses appear. Um, just, just a quick note here, this, I created this project using the default um, out of the box architecture template, okay? So you can come in here, create four walls, do exactly what I did, and then change the phase filter and, and just take a look at how the various elements appear if just to help you get a better understanding of phases if you're if you're not too familiar with those. Uh, you can also change the visual style here uh, and you can see how that affects the graphics as well. Okay. All right, like I said, I know we're we're kind of at a going rapid fire here. Let me just bring this back up here, keep you keep us on track here. Okay. Next thing is materials. So let's take a look here, um, just a brief look at materials here. So what I wanna show, let me open up the material browser here. So right now I'm in the shaded visual style and let's find that brick. Just I think this is the brick that appears here. So um, two things that I wanna draw your attention to. On the graphics tab here in the material editor, this will control uh, how the materials appear in the, hang on a minute, there we go. Let me just make sure I have that selected. On the graphics tab, that controls how the materials will appear in the shaded uh, visual style. Whereas on the appearance tab, this is an, what's called a material asset. And on the appearance tab, that is how the material will appear in the realistic visual style, as well as when it is rendered. Okay, so just be aware of that. So basically shaded, realistic, and rendered. Um, on the graphics tab under shading, you can choose to use rendered appearance, but it's not necessarily, really all it's going, going to do is update your color here. So when I click OK, you can see that we're still using that same pattern, but we, uh, we the color updated there, okay? Whereas if I change this to the realistic visual style, then you will see that image that we saw, you'll see that being used uh, and we'll get similar to what we would see in a rendering there. Um, so anyways, just be aware of the differences there uh, on these two tabs. 
Um, just another quick note here, you can also get creative and add both a background pattern. So if you wanted to do like a solid fill and a certain color and then a brick pattern, that's something you could do as well. Um, last thing I'll mention here on materials, if I duplicate a material, and I'll just call this Brick Common 2, be aware that the appearance asset is going to be the same as whatever you duplicated. So in this case, I duplicated the just the Brick uh, Common there, and when I duplicated it, I'm using that same appearance asset. So if I make a change to that appearance asset, it's also going to change for the material that I duplicated. So what you'll want to do is go in there and replace that asset uh, and, and maybe even create a new asset. Okay, let's continue right along here. Next thing on the list here is transparency. Um, so a lot of times people like to make certain, uh, they, they want to make certain things transparent, okay? So let's talk about a few different, sorry, two different controls here for transparency. Uh, if I click the visual style button here in the view control bar, I can select graphic display options. And under model display, you'll notice there's a transparency control. This control right here, that'll affect the entire model. So basically all elements in the model, okay? Uh, so you can adjust the, you know, the amount of transparency there. And as you can see, it applies to the entire model. But if I go into the visibility graphic overrides dialog, uh, let's just say, you know what, let's do walls here. If I scroll down to walls, you'll notice that there's also a transparency control, but this is per category, okay? So if we just want to do a specific category, then we can use that control in the visibility graphic overrides dialog, all right? So just be aware of the differences there. Graphic display options for the entire model, visibility graphic overrides dialog, that is just for specific categories. All right, I'll go ahead and clear that. All right, that's transparency. Next up, temporary hide isolate. So if you are not familiar with the temporary hide isolate tools, I, I definitely recommend that you check these out. So if you look in the view control bar and you see the little glasses icon, when you expand that, you'll notice that there's four controls here and they're grayed out until you actually select something. So if I select the roof here, then I can expand temporary hide isolate, and I'll start with hide element. When I click hide element, that hides the roof in this view, but it does it temporarily, okay? And I can continue, so I think, what is this, the ceiling? Uh, I can hide it, I can just kind of continue working, you know, ha whatever you're trying to do in a view, right? Maybe if you're trying to, to dig down and see something, um, you, can, you can just hide elements and kind of work your way into the model and, and see, uh, whatever you're trying to see. But the good thing is that it is just a temporary view mode. So anytime you see a colored boundary around your drawing area, you know that you are in a temporary view mode, right? So I can go back to the temporary hide isolate button and reset the temporary hide isolate and they'll come back, okay? It'll restore back to your all your view properties. You can you can hide elements, you can even hide the category. So I have one wall selected, so I can hide the walls category. Um, let's reset that. If I'm focusing on just the roof here, I can isolate that element. Um, lots, lots of flexibility with these controls, okay? Um, like I said, I'm a huge fan of them. Um, but what I see too often is that people that aren't aware of these, they will begin to use the hide element tool. So be aware that up here in the ribbon, hide elements will actually hide it in the view, and it's not a temporary view state, okay? So if somebody opens your model and they're like, oh, I have a wall missing or whatever it may be, right? Um, that's, a, that's an actual change you make in your view properties. It's not just a temporary thing, so it can get very confusing. So I tell people, do not use this tool, okay? I just... Try not to ever use it, okay, unless you like absolutely have a random one-off situation where you think it's absolute, absolutely necessary. Um, but I always turn to these temporary hide isolate tools. Also, a quick note, if you create families, uh, when, I, when I, I create families all the time and I use them, uh, yeah, a ton. I, I know I'm kind of rambling on at this point, but 
Uh, if you're creating geometry, you can isolate the geometry and a couple reference planes if you're trying to make a constraint and you have a lot going on. Um, I use those tools all the time. I'll just kind of leave it at that. So, okay, temporary hide isolate. All right, just to just to help you see where we're at now. So we are uh, number 10, okay? So I know that we're, um, yeah, like I said, we're trying to fly through the, the last, the last part we'll go through a little bit quicker than the first ones there. So, okay, number 10, view templates. Okay, so let's go back to uh, this floor plan view here, okay? So a couple notes on view templates. So if we go to the view ribbon, and here in the graphics panel, you can see the view templates button, okay? So we can, you can set the view properties for a view however you want them, and then you can create a template from the current view, okay? I'm not gonna go into that much right now. I'm just gonna click manage view templates, and in the view templates dialog, you can see all the view templates that you have. So for this floor plan view, I'm gonna use this architectural plan. Uh, once again, this is just out of the box Revit template that we use. Uh, when you look at a template here, you can see all of the view properties and everything with the check mark in the include column will be included in that view template. So if you don't want a certain property included, just simply deselect that. Um, and then you can, you can make any changes as needed here, okay? So uh, just for example, I'll change the detail level to, let's just say fine, I'll click okay. Okay, so now I have a view template. Now there's two ways that you can use it. Uh, this is where I found that a lot of Revit users aren't aware of that. So there's two ways that you can actually use a view template. If you go to the view ribbon and expand the view templates button, you can apply template properties to the current view. Okay, so let's look at that. So I'm going to click Apply Template Properties. This opens the Apply View Template dialog, and I'll select Architectural Plan and click OK. Now you can see that our filters went away because they weren't included in that view template. Uh, but at this point, I am free to make any changes to the view properties, okay? So I can change the detail level. I can change it back to course. Um, you know, I, I can change the scale. Let's do, let's say, a quarter of an inch equals a foot. Um, I, I can continue making changes to the view properties. So when you apply a view template, it's a one-time application of those view properties. After that, you can change whatever you want. The other way to use a view template is by assigning it to the view. And you can do that by finding the view template parameter here under Identity Data in your Properties palette, clicking the button right next to it, and then this opens the Assign View Template dialog. Now when I select the Architectural Plan View Template and click OK, the view properties update again, and this time you can see that all of the view properties are grayed out, at least all the ones that are included in that view template. So what assigning a view template does is it essentially creates a link between your view and the view template so that any changes you make here to the view template will then propagate to any view that has that view template assigned, okay? So just be aware of that. Um, I, I think it's very critical that Revit users understand the difference between applying and assigning a view template. Okay, so kind of continuing on that, if, you, if you're working in a view that has a view template assigned and all the view properties are grayed out, um, you may need to make, you know, you may want to turn on a linked model. Uh, maybe if, if you have a Navisworks model linked in, you want to turn it on, you're coordinating, something like that, right? Um, you can still do that in the view. You don't have to go in and adjust the view template. What you can do is use temporary view properties. So if you go to the view control bar, the, so the second one from the right is temporary view properties. And the first thing you can do is enable temporary view properties. When you do, you'll see the border around the drawing window again. It says temporary view properties. Now all of your view properties are available. So you can, you know, you can change, you can change whatever you want, okay? Uh, and, sorry, when I say whatever you want, I mean view properties, okay? So we can turn off, um, whatever, I'll turn off the walls category. Um, you know, you can turn on and off linked models, whatever, okay? If you make any changes to the view properties, they, you can reset those. But be aware that if you make changes to model elements, so like I'll nudge this a bit, 
that's not temporary, okay? When you actually change the model, that does not fall under temporary view properties because you're changing the model, not a view property, okay? So just make sure you, I wanna be clear on that. So then we can go back to the temporary view properties button and restore the view properties. And now it resets all the view properties. So basically everything that can be accessed from your properties palette for that current view. So you'll notice that my door is still missing, that this door still moved because that was not a temporary, that, had, that didn't, had nothing to do with the view properties that had to do with the actual model, okay? But when you have view templates assigned, temporary view properties is a great, uh, great tool there. Uh, last note here on those, you can also temporarily apply a, another view template. Um, so if you had, you know, um, you had a specific template for coordination or something like that, uh, you could temporarily apply that. Okay, um, kind of continuing on those lines, when you when it gets to view types, all right, so we kind of talked about this with sections. So with section views, we can have multiple view types, right? Um, also with floor plan views, we can have multiple view types. So right now, we just have one floor plan type here, okay? Um, and then floor plan, yeah, there's a couple graphics options here, but Back to the view templates, you can choose a view template that will be applied to new views that are created using that type. All right, so for example, if I click the button there, I can assign a view template here, click the architectural plan one that we were using. Um, and then this checkbox right here, that controls whether or not the view template is simply applied or whether it is actually assigned. So if I deselect this checkbox, then I'm simply just going to apply it to new views. Whereas if I select this checkbox, then I will actually assign it to new views that are created using this type, okay? So um, yeah, just for example here, I'll create another one here, we can click that. So now we have two types here. Um, just to, you know, you, you could create view types for, uh, you know, interior views, core and shell for, coordination, uh, lots of options there, however you wanna go about that. But when you go create a new floor plan view or a new ceiling plan view, you can select from the various uh, view types here, okay? So just be aware that that, that is available. Um, okay, let me bring this back up just to refresh you where we're at here. So we just got done with number 12, we're just moving right along here, um, 13. So we'll start to, uh, speed through these last few here and get to the finish line. Okay, the next one that I have on the list here is the view scale to detail level. So if we go to the manage ribbon and expand additional settings and click detail level, this opens up the view scale to detail level correspondence dialog. So what this does is this allows you to set the detail level based on the scale of the new view. So just, just for example here, let's say you want all your views at an eighth of an inch equals a foot to be at the medium level of detail. So say you create a new view at that scale and it comes in at course and you have to go change that and you're tired of changing that. All you gotta do is just change it to where your eighth of an inch equals a foot is moved over here under medium. And then when you create a section at an eighth of an inch equals a foot, it'll be at medium, okay? Uh, or whatever, you can adjust these however you want. Um, just a little tip there that that I've found. People um, they always ask me like, hey, I, I create the views, they always start out a course, how do I change that? This is where you would change that. Okay, color schemes. So next up is color schemes and room fills. Uh, those kind of kind of go together, at least to what I'm trying to show here. So if I come down here in the properties palette, or sorry, I don't need to go down that far. So color scheme. All right, when I click the button next to color scheme, it opens up the edit color scheme dialog and I can apply a color scheme to rooms. And right now in this, in this project here, we have two schemes, so name and department. So I'll select name just for this example and click okay. And now we have applied a color scheme that's based on the room name, okay? So that's, Straightforward. I'm not going to go into too much detail on, on color schemes, but that obviously affects the graphics in your view there, okay? And sometimes people can kind of get some things confused a little bit. So let me show you here. Um, 
or actually have a view template assigned here. So let me, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna remove that real quick for this example. So let's go to the visibility graphic overrides dialog. We'll take a look at the rooms category and you'll notice that color fill is an option here. So if I turn off that color fill, that will control the visibility of that color scheme that's applied to the view. So if you have any issues there with your color scheme actually showing, you wanna check this, okay, the color fill option here. Um, if another thing here, so this is kind of the second, you know, moving on to the second thing. So there's also an interior fill. So this is different than the color fill. So when I click apply, it simply applies an interior fill, which is just a, a generic blue color. Uh, we can also do the reference there, and that'll turn on the reference lines for the room. So the main point I'm trying to make here is that the color fill under, so this subcategory under rooms applies to your color scheme, whereas the interior fill is just kind of a, yeah, generic blue color here that, that gets applied. So uh, just, let me pull this back up here. So just a quick note there for 14 and 15, um, kind of two, two quick things right there. Okay, all right, where are we at now? Number 16, view discipline. Okay, and what I'm gonna do, I'm actually going to switch to another session of Revit here where I have another model up. Um, so right now I have a few different linked models in here for uh, an architecture, MEP, and a structure. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about discipline and the, the view discipline parameter and the, the under, halftone underlay settings, sorry. So let's start out here with discipline. So right now we're set to architectural and this, the, I feel like the discipline parameter is, doesn't get touched on a whole lot, but basically what it does is it controls the priority, uh, it controls which categories of elements get priority in the view. So if I have architectural selected, then the architectural elements get priority in the view. Whereas if I change it to something like mechanical, mechanical, electrical, or plumbing, then those elements will get priority in the view. And if I select coordination, then all elements will have basically equal priority in the view, okay? So um, if you're trying to, you know, let, let's just, well, sorry, I don't want to go too in depth here, but you know, depending on what you're trying to do here, um, you just need to be aware of what the discipline is. So, for example, here, if I'm looking at MEP, you can see that all the architectural elements are transparent because the discipline's set to mechanical. Whereas, if I change it to architectural, then the architectural elements get priority there. So, just a quick note on on the view discipline there. Um, also. Depending on the discipline, so right now if I have it mechanical, then the architectural elements become half tone. And depending, yeah, however you may want to show that, you can actually control the brightness of those half tone elements. And you can do that on the manage ribbon by expanding that additional settings button and clicking, um, here we go, half tone underlay. And then we can control the brightness of those elements. So you can see that architectural model gets a little bit brighter. Whereas if I bump it down, see it gets very, very light. You can't even hardly see it. So be aware that this can be used and, and as far as the elements that it affects will be different depending on the discipline. Uh, so there's definitely kind of a, um, a corroboration between those two tools, if you will. Okay, view discipline. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I guess I kind of didn't mention this, but also if you have an underlay, you can choose for the underlay to apply a half tone to the underlay, and then the, the brightness controls will affect those underlay elements as well. Next up, uh, detail level overrides. So if I have, um, let's just say we're, we have a coordination view set up here, and I'm going to change my detail level to fine. So I want to, let's say I want to see all of my wall detail. Let me switch on thin lines here real quick, just so we can see that a little bit better. Um, so let's say that I want the ductwork, uh, you know, I want to, I want all of that single line 
and but I want to keep my architectural components. I want to see all of that detail. So if I go into here to the visibility graphic overrides dialog, I can actually overwrite the detail level for specific categories of elements. Okay, so if I change the ductwork to coarse, uh, let's find duct fittings as well. So everything else is fine, and then all my ductwork will be coarse, so I can change that to single line. Um, so be aware of, of that. Uh, I, think, I think that's something important to, to keep in mind. Okay, let me pull this up real quick here. Let me take a, a drink real quick. Okay, uh, four more to go. We're like I said, we're we're blazing right through this here. Okay, so when it comes to the visibility graphic overrides, right? That's when we type BV or VG, we open up this dialog here. So any change you make on the model categories tab or annotation categories tab, that's going to affect your entire view. All right. So for example, if I turn off air terminals, click apply, all the air terminals turn off. Um, those are lighting fixtures, by the way. Um, if let's say that you as the you're an architect and you place the lighting fixtures and air terminals, and you they, it also gets placed in the MEP model and you want to turn those off, okay? So, but you still want to see yours, okay? So you don't make that change here on the model categories tab. Uh, otherwise, it'll turn off both yours and any links that you have as well. So what you need to do is go to the Revit links tab, and you kind of have to dig into these links a little bit. Uh, so for example, if we want to turn off the lighting fixtures and air terminals and just the MEP link, then we need to click this button here under display settings and on the basics tab we'll switch it to custom and then that allows us to then go to the model categories tab and change this to custom all right so like i said we kind of have to dig into it a bit and then we can turn off air terminals and lighting fixtures and and really anything out like anything in the structural model or mep model or whatever you're trying to do just be aware that you can control those separately for the links, okay? Um, now, granted, I don't have air terminals or lighting fixtures in this architectural model, but um, just wanted to show those controls there. All right. Um, so, yeah, just, just to summarize there, um, it's most people are pretty familiar with how this dialog works but sometimes they don't realize that there are kind of additional controls here under the Revit links tab. All right, view range. Let's talk a little bit about view range. So if we scroll down in the properties palette, you can see the view range parameter here. You can click edit. Uh, you can also use the, de the default keyboard shortcut VR. Um, I, I think a lot of people are familiar with the view range. Uh, you can click the show button here to show this little display. Um, now, MEP elements pretty straightforward. If they're in the view range here, what I mean by that is between the top and the view depth, they're going to show. Architectural, most architectural elements, pretty straightforward. Uh, when it comes to things like windows and doors, they have to be cut by the cut plane for them to show. Um, certain things um, like casework, they appear differently depending on, on where they display. But one thing that can be a little tricky is when it comes to structural elements, those behave a little bit differently. Uh, the structural framing elements actually have to be below the cut plane for them to actually show in the view. So for example, if I change this to 12 feet and click OK, then we can see our structural framing there. Just to help us see it a little bit better, I'll turn off floors. And now we can see all the structural framing there. Um, so anyways, I know that's super fast there on the view range. Uh, but just a couple notes on that to clarify some things that kind of get people confused. Okay, let's switch let's switch to this little sample model here and touch on our last two things. So sketchy lines and depth queuing. So sketchy lines, I, I'm trying to remember, I should have looked this up before, but I think those were new features added sometime around 2017 or 2018. Uh, but anyways, if you're not aware of those, uh, let's let's start with sketchy lines. So if I click the visual style button and then click graphic display options, 
then we can, in this graphic display options dialog, let's expand sketchy lines. And when I enable sketchy lines, I can then control the jitter and the extension. All right, so really what this does, let me just click apply first and you can kind of see. So it, the, the idea with sketchy lines is to make it look like it's a hand-drawn sketch. So jitter controls the, you know, the curviness in the line, if you will. I'm sure there's a better term to describe that. Um, the jitteriness, whereas the extension that controls how far beyond those those inlines the the sketch lines extend. Um, but as you can see here, it, it totally changes the look of the view. You can change the visual style as well, um, and, and have something that looks like you know somebody sketched it. Okay, so pretty cool, or something that I think is really cool that you can do uh, right here in Revit in a in a building model. And then lastly, if I switch to an elevation view, um, and I don't know, let's change the, the visual style to shaded here. So depth queuing is another feature that you can enable, and it helps add depth to section and elevation views, okay? So right now, everything basically looks like it's at the same plane. But if I, let's go enable depth queuing here, and First thing we need to do is click show depth, which enables the feature. And then we have two controls here, a fade, uh, sorry, a fade start and end location, and then the fade limit. So if I click apply, let's just take a closer look there. You can see that things that are farther away from our, our vantage point, if you will, uh, they, they are faded into the view, whereas things are, are brighter. Um, anyways, some of you may be using those features. Maybe you weren't aware that, that they existed. Um, you know, depending on the view and, and how you have that elevation, wherever that cut plane is, you may want to make some slight adjustments here. Um, and then, yeah, play around with these and, and try to get it to however you want it to appear. Uh, but lo lots of cool things that, that you can do there. Okay, so I believe we covered them all. So I, like I said, I know we went through that really fast. Um, just a, another quick plug here. I, I know I mentioned this before. If, um, if you take a look at our blog here, here's the URL. But if you, you know, click to bim.com slash blog, that'll get you to our blog. But this is that specific uh, blog series that, that we did on uh, Revit visibility. Um, anyways, just a quick note on that. If you want some additional content there, this uh, webinar is also being recorded. So you can go back through and, and take a look at something that we may have went through really fast. But uh, yeah, with that, I, I appreciate you being here and I hope that you learned something. And um, yeah, I'm going to turn it back over to Alan to wrap this thing up. Perfect. All right, thanks, Jason. Really, really good stuff. Um, just a quick reminder for anybody who's looking for AIA credits, uh, continuing education credits for being on this call today please go ahead and send it in the questions box. Um, I've seen a lot of you send it there. A lot of you ask questions, that same place you're asking questions. Just go ahead and send your AIA number and your name, and that's what we need, okay? Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move to that first question. So Jason, uh, regarding view ranges, is there a way to make uh, level changes above the cut plane visible? specifically soffits or arches above that would traditionally be shown in plan in dashed lines. I don't know if you need that again. I know it was a, a long So one. I think I think I understand what's being asked. So basically um so like uh, sorry I heard soffits and um what was the other one? Just soffits and arches above that would traditionally be shown in plan in dashed lines. Gotcha, okay. So there is a tool, and if I'm still sharing my screen, I, I can- Yep, you are, move good to go. Real quick there. Um, I'm blanking, oh no, here we go. So on the view ribbon in the graphics panel, there is this show hidden lines tool. Um, I believe that is, so right here, this simple little video that displays that, you know, kind of gives you an idea what it does. But if I'm not mistaken, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think that they could use this tool 
to be able to show that that you know, like soffits and whatnot in a in a plan view when it's above the cut plane. So ho hopefully that helps. I, yeah, I'd recommend trying out this tool. If if not, if that doesn't answer the question, please write us back. Uh, okay, the next question here: Can sketchy lines and depth queuing be included uh, in a view template? Oh yes, um, they yes they can. So if I um, let's just say create template from current view here, um, and we take a look here at sketchy lines. So yeah, here's sketchy lines here in the 3D view, um, and then if we were to look at an elevation view. You can see that um, I see that depth queuing. I, I, I know, yeah, I know it's in here, but let me just switch. Let me just redo that real quick. There, let's do do a a section view, and if we depth queuing, there we go. Okay, so yes, we can add it to elevation and section views for depth queuing and sketchy lines. And then in a 3D view, you can add sketchy lines. Perfect. Uh, next question that I'm seeing here, uh, what are some scenarios for applying a view template versus, a, versus assigning a view template? Oh, sure. So we did, yeah, we did kind of speed through that. So what I typically do when I help an organization implement BIM workflows, uh, I set up what I call working views and documentation views. And you could really, you could call those whatever you wanted to. But the idea is that you have documentation views that are going to be placed on sheets or they're going to be exported to some form of output, uh, where, you know, whether it's um, exporting the Navisworks or exporting the CAD or whatever. And in anything that's going to be output, whether it be printed or, or exported, I have a view template assigned. That way we have those views locked down and the view properties should not change unless it goes through the BIM manager. Um, and then the working views, I typically leave those open. And what I mean by that is not, I don't have a view template assigned and the users can make adjustments on the fly as they go and do their work, okay? Um, so working views, modeling views, but the idea there is that they're only going to be seen by the, the detailers, the modelers, the uh, designers, what you know, whatever their titles are. Um, and then in that case, they could apply templates for different scenarios, you know, whether it be coordination or, or simply modeling or, or whatnot. Um, so that's kind of starting out how I would recommend to kind of use uh, assigning view templates versus applying them. Great. Uh, I have one more question here again uh, in the last couple seconds here. If you need AIA credits and you have not yet sent your name and AIA number, please go ahead and send that over or any last minute questions. Uh, the last question I have here for now, Jason, is there a way uh, to import Excel sheets into Revit without third party software? Oh, good question there. Um, a way to import it without third party software? Um, so, I mean, the short answer is no. Um, there is Dynamo. So if I go to the manage ribbon there, I, I, I'm sure you've all heard of Dynamo by now, but I would say that would be the closest thing, you know, now that Dynamo is native to Revit. Um, and there are some ways that you can kind of get set up with that, you know, relatively easily by reading a few blog posts and stuff. But um, but yeah, other than that, I would say no, there's there's not really a great way without Dynamo or, or some other third party application. Got it. Okay. We do have a couple more that came in. We have a couple more minutes here. Uh, can you explain how can you run a quick Dynamo routine? I don't know if we have time to get into Dynamo really um, right now. I don't know, Jason, if you have something, but I know Dynamo is a little bit of a uh, a little bit more than than a minute or two. Um, yeah, um, I you know I um, I was trying to think if there'd be a quick example. Um, I, I I don't have anything set up with these models that I'm using right now. Um, 
uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, if I'm limited to just like a minute or two, I, I would I'd say I don't have anything right off the bat. But there are some things that you can do, you know, really quickly to kind of get it open up and, uh, you know, get some parameters, change some parameters, stuff like that. I use them a lot for project setup. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't I don't have anything prepared like right now to, to just kind of jump into. Maybe maybe that'll be something for the next webinar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Okay. Uh, is there a way to add revisions to all sheets at once? Oh, oh, that's a great question. Um, so that's actually something that I use Dynamo for too. Um, cause yeah, that, let's see, do we have any sheets here? So yeah, like if I, um, if I open up a sheet here and we, so this revisions on sheet parameter, I'm assuming that's what they're talking about there where you can control the revision on the sheet. Uh, whereas if you select multiple sheets, unfortunately, that option goes away. You, you can only do it one at a time. Uh, but I do have a, a Dynamo script to where, um, yeah, have it set up to where you can do that for multiple sheets um, at once. But yeah, not, not sure. just with Revit, though, unfortunately. Got it. Uh, okay, the one last question we'll get into. Uh... How do view depth sliders affect the depth? The, um, I'm assuming that's talking about the depth queuing. Let's see here. So, uh, let me let me just open up. Where was I at? The the west elevation view here. So if I open up the say the level one floor plan view, uh, you know we don't even see those elevation markers, do we? Let me, it's probably cropped out here. Let's see. Sorry, I was trying to find where the, oh, I guess it's right here. Is that, does that open the west elevation? Okay, so if I go back here and we look at the depth queuing here, and I'm, I'm thinking that the question had to do with like these, the depth sliders there. I apologize if I'm misunderstanding um, but this is basically the the fade start and end location. So uh, I guess the best way to describe it is if I'm looking here at this view, and here's my cut plane, so that the near and far, so the near slider basically controls the so when that um, you know that depth uh, cha cha changing in. Oh, sorry, I'm stumbling all over my words here. Basically, that first slider controls where that fading starts, and then the second one controls where it ends. So if you look at it from the cut plane to you know back on the distance back from that, that's basically what those sliders do, uh, if if that makes sense. All right, perfect. So uh, Jason, can I have you jump back to the slides just to uh, to close out here? I'm sorry, I know we had another a yeah. uh, couple of questions come in there at the end, but we do have to end as we're at the top of the hour here. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Jason. Thank you all for being here uh, for our 22 things you must know about Revit visibility and graphics webinar. Uh, please be on the lookout for future webinars. Maybe we'll have something come up in the future on Dynamo. It seems like we had some questions around that. Um, and again, please contact us at 305-445-6480 or shoot us an, in, an email at info at ddscad.com for any additional information or question regarding uh, new features, training, support, pricing, any of that stuff that we might be able to help you with. And uh, again, this webinar will be emailed out to you soon, and it will be on our DDS CAD YouTube channel as well. Uh, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.